It's Andrew Seaman, LinkedIn Senior News Editor for Job Searches and Careers. So today we have someone who often talks about their own history with job searching and resonates so well with job seekers. We have Sweta Regmi, who is the founder and CEO of Teach and Do and a job search expert. So I want to bring Sweta onto the screen. Welcome. Hi, thank you for inviting me. I'm so excited to be here today. Of course, thank you so much for joining us. I think probably so many job seekers on the platform know you. You are omnipresent on LinkedIn, so I'm so happy that you're here with us. And can you tell us a little bit about your background? Because you're so open about sort of the struggles you had with job searching. And I think that is part of the reason it resonates so much with people. Thank you so much for asking. And for those of you who do not know me, I've been there. I was um, laid off <clears throat> literally in one minute over the phone and I lost my title. And next day I had no idea who was I. It was very difficult for me to bounce back. I had over a year of gap on it and I put this strategy together. Even though I was in a leadership role, for more than a decade, <clears throat> I used to be hiring manager, right? And I would think that I would bounce back quite quickly, but that did not happen at all. So, I mean, layoff happened when, you know, there was no pandemic, nothing like that either. It was not normal for me to actually get that one minute call. And then, you know, someone telling me the role's been eliminated, right? Bunch of us were let go and I happened to be there as well. And you know what? It was the worst thing I thought that happened to me. But fast forward later, honestly, it was a blessing in disguise. I don't think I would be here today if that didn't happen. So thank you for whoever did that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I know it doesn't feel good in the moment, but really moments are often what you make of it. And there's going to be difficult times, you know, all the time. But I find that, you know, suffering comes in cycles. So, you know, there will be a moment when you're having a bad day but the next day it might be a better day and the day might be better after that. So I, I think you definitely turned uh, the following days into better days once you have that, that um, bad experience. Sweta, one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about was expectations when you're entering a job search, because I think a lot of people, they expect I'm going to send out a few resumes, uh, someone's going to call me back, I'm going to have a great interview, but that's often not the reality, is it? No, absolutely not. You know what? Um, it all depends on your personal situation, where you are. So I'd like you to think about this. How did you become a job seeker? You got to try to go back. Uh, were you fresher? You just recently graduated. Your situation could be completely different. I was laid off and it was completely different. So first of all was I needed to heal. I had really bitter, 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 you know, um, ego inside. Why me? Why, how dare they? You know, so I had to heal. And the way I did it was I traveled, I volunteered, and I tried to make sure that I am completely healed before I go back to the workforce. And then after that, as well. I thought that the employers would just, you know, give you multiple offers. That did not happen. And I think I had to sit down and do some self-reflections. Who am I? What am I targeting? Because people like us, when you're at that stage where you've done it all, bunch of roles all together, and you are kind of like thinking you're an expert at everything, that's where I was. So my marketing documents were not clear at all. I was praying and spraying, and then I sent a bunch of spam on LinkedIn, and I was in jail as well. So I've learned the hard way, right? So, and that's what I teach right now, what not to do from the job seeker perspective. Eventually I got back, but the reality was completely different when I started to look into the marketing documents, who is, what's my niche market? Where am I targeting and why am I better at things and what I can bring it from the previous experience? Do I need to step down? And plus, the worst thing happened to me was I moved as well from Toronto to different city, which was remote, which was kind of like bilingual. So you really had to tame it down a bit. Who are your targeted uh, industry who are the employers? I had to put it all together. And then honestly, um, I think there's a word out there in the street. It takes 21 days, 21 days to actually get into the habit. 
when you're a job seeker, you have no habit. You're going nine to five and you're just doing whatever. But when you become job seeker, you have no idea where do you start. So you got to put the planning process together. So 21 days, you go consistently and then put the you know framework together and you stick to it for 90 days. That's what I did. So by 90 days, I figured it out, self-reflected what's working, what's not working. And the reality was completely different. Things that you can control, biases out there. You know, I mean, ageism is there. There are like so many biases, right? Things that you cannot control, but there are things you can control is branding on resume. How do you show up in an interview? What do you talk about it? How do you negotiate the offer, right? And those are completely different. It all depends on a personal situation where you are at the career. And then, you know what, one size does not fit all. Yeah, I think those are such good suggestions, um, especially the focus on what you can control, because I think a lot of job seekers, they set really unrealistic expectations for themselves. And it's not their fault. They want to be go-getters. They want to go out there and really get the best job that they can, but they end up putting pressure on themselves for things that they can't control, like getting a certain number of job interviews within a given time span. While we hope that happens, we can't control whether we actually get those interviews, but you can control how many people you network with during the week. You can control how many times you post on your profile. You can control how much time you dedicate to learning, things like that. So those are wins that will still propel you forward. So I think your suggestion is spot on. And Sweta, my next question is just basically, you know, rejection is part of the job search process. It's just inherently something that a lot of most people will deal with. Either you don't hear back from a job, which is inherent rejection, or you might get an actual letter that says, thank you, but no thanks. How do you deal with sort of several rejections or is getting knocked back because you can focus on what you're controlling, but it still is a little bit hit, hit to your ego when you do get those rejections? Absolutely. Great question there. You know what? Um, first thing first is you got to self-reflect. Are you shooting the shots? That's exactly what I was doing. Are you qualified? The bottom line is, are you qualified for the role, right? Think about from hiring manager's perspective. They're there to make money for a business. And why would they hire you? Just give you a chance, right? What's in? What's in for them, right? So I think I was shooting a shot and obviously listen to the other people as well, right? Like try it. It doesn't hurt you. And then it hurt me. Self-doubt, confidence, low self-esteem. And I started to explore and think like, what's wrong with me? I am so qualified but I'm not getting it. But I was not targeting the right role, right? I was not speaking to their language. So when you get the rejections, when we point the finger right there, you know, other fingers are pointing where, you know that, right? And we as a human being, and I was, I had that ego as well. You got the valid point. The ego needs to be adjusted. Shoot that ego out of the door when you're a job seeker, and it taught me, honestly, I think I had major ego problem. I was hiring manager. I was in the leadership role. I knew it all. I, I was expert on it. I was not willing to self-reflect. Um, why am I being rejected? So it was resume branding. It was not clear because I, I was acting like I, I can do everything. You know, at one point I was trying to apply for a hard, you know, HR manager where I didn't even do the, you know, the courses for HR and stuff like that. I was not the right fit because I was shooting the shot everywhere. So you have to go back and tame it down and think who you are when the rejection come in, comes in. You're not getting interviewed. There is something probably on a resume. You're not singing their song right? You're not getting hired in interview. At what stage? Is it first phone screening? There's something going on on phone screening. You're not communicating well. A lot of people, what they tend to do is phone screening. They're so chill and relaxed. But I believe that that's the major, major phone interview ever. And I've done that as a hiring manager. If I didn't like it, I never call them for face-to-face -face interview, right? When you go on face-to-face -face interview, at what point you get rejected? Is it the after presentation? Is it after the personality test? What kind of personality they are looking for? There are so many things you got to go and think it through what stage and then start self-reflecting um, self and start working on it. And as you said, there is no control like, you know, they, no one can control the process but you on that process. But if they reject you and you know you're the right you're the right fit. Maybe you are not. Maybe there's an internal hire. Maybe they're better at it. Right. So I think learn to self-reflect 
and walk away sometime. It's okay to walk away as well. You don't you you are going to be working with that amazing employer one day. You just need to be hired by one person. Your day is going to come in. So keep your hopes high. Um, and self-reflecting is the key here. Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, like you said, look at what you're doing. If you are running into roadblocks or somewhere along the process, that's where you keep stumbling. That might be a time to sort of look and say, okay, what's going on here? How can I change my methods? And that's also such a smart way to just approach really most things is that, you know, if you keep doing the same thing and you're getting the same result, at what point do things start to derail? And what you can do is you can end up basically saying, hey, listen, you know, this is the point where, you know, I need to focus on because this seems to be where things are shaky. But at the same time, while you're working on yourself, like you said, you shouldn't take things personally because who knows what's happening behind the scenes. Um, and the, another question that I wanted to ask you is, you know, people feel ashamed often when they're looking for work. And especially when that, that uh, job search starts stretching into months instead of weeks, um, which is actually very common. Most most job searches, searches take a few months. Um, so when people do feel ashamed, they, they try not to talk about it, things like that. But job seekers really should be open about their job search because I, I assume that helps them. What are your thoughts about that? Absolutely. Great questions there. I was on the same boat as well. So when I got laid off, it was completely, I was taken back and like it was my fault unwanted child, you know, and you didn't want to talk about it. I avoided all the networking events, all the parties, because I know people are going to ask me, what do you do? And then I had no answers. I did not have elevator pitch. I did not have my branding statement properly done. So I did not know what I wanted. So first of all, before you even start talking about um, getting a job, you need to know who you are. You need to be very clear on what you want. And then it's easier for the other people. So I started reaching out to uh, the network that I really trusted. And you know what the major problem was, you know, I did not know what I wanted. I said, hey, are you hiring um, into the into this area? Here's my resume. Right. And I think almost the responsibility was the onus was for them to find me a job. And I don't blame anybody because no one teaches you the strategy, the building networking strategies. How do you even activate the network? You've never talked to the person for so many years. And all of a sudden you assume that they know everything about you, right? So you got to reactivate the network, but you need to know what you want before you even reach out. And there's no harm on reaching out to the right network because most people listen to you just to judge you, right? So you want to make sure you reach out to the right people who have influence. And what I, what I think that a lot of people miss is Oh, reach out to anybody networking and they will refer you. That's wrong because I was a hiring manager when someone actually unknown people reached out to me. Here's my resume. Honestly, I couldn't care less. I don't even know you. You've never even tried to build a relationship. Why would I hire you? And then anyone inside the organization gave me the referral. If I didn't like the referral, then I didn't even. That actually went against them. So I already knew the strategy. If I wanted to get into that industry, if I want to get that job in that particular company, I need to influence the influencer. So that's the strategy I use. I need to make sure whoever refers me, they have a very good relationship with the hiring manager. If they put the word saying that Swatha is really good at what she does, uh, half of the battle is done. So you need to pick the right people, not just random people, uh, even on networking as well, right? Build a relationship, you know they have influences and then grow from it, right? And then starting with the strangers as well, there are a lot of strangers, they help me better than people I knew, right? This is when you get to know who are your really friends, who are truly out there to help you out. And this is when you know that who are really there <laughs> you know, when you had a title, this is the time to scan your network. And, um, you know, it's okay to walk away and cut the ties. And I've done that. Uh, so what, what is your advice for other people who are finding it difficult um, to, to endure a long job search? I saw in the comments, I think Keith said he's been looking uh, for a job for several months and it's tough. So what are your other suggestions about enduring a job, long job search? Okay. So I think what I did that worked for me was when I knew that I'm not getting a result, again, I'm going back to my framework and seeing where am I stuck? And then I felt like, okay, maybe it was a courses. One of the courses I took it because, you know, um, I wanted to know the uh, market out there because I was working with the same company for more than 12 years. When people are working with the same company for so long, they tend to lose the touch in outside world. The tools and resources that it's been currently used 
issues in the market. So you need to go and upgrade it if you could. Here's the catch though, right? A lot of people, what they do is, okay, you know what? If I do, if I get these certifications, if I go and upgrade myself, um, I am entitled to get a job. That's not gonna happen. Not every industry wants that certifications, right? They prefer experience. So, but know those, um, let's say, you know, tools and resources, that's a first step. And the second step is go and, um, you know, join the group where the people like you are there, which is, you know, um, the job seeker accountability group, if you want to. But here's the catch, though, right? There's gonna be a lot of negative vibes as well, because people are miserable there. And I've been there, right? People are negative, but you got to hang around with the people who are really positive, who are optimistic, and who are confident, helping each other out helps as well. And then being a part of the organizations, if you're in the, let's say, banking world, then be a part of that, you know, the organization where the hiring managers are hanging out and showcase it, build a network Working. And one thing I did, which worked out correctly for me was, as soon as I got laid off, you know, I, um, I had a great relationship with people who actually left the organizations, the good people, I wanted to be part of them. Anyway, I always reached out to them, hey, I'm sorry to see you go. It was great, you know, working with you. I reactivated the same people who were laid off as well. And I started connecting what worked for you? What didn't work for you? Would you have any tips for me, right? Because they've been in the same situations. And it was a golden nugget that I got it from them, from everything to the courses they took, right? So you got to make sure that you hang out with the people who's gone through the same pain and um, they've bounced back now. They are the great, great team to be surrounded by. Um, so Swada, I think it's time to take some uh, questions from people in uh, the audience. And we have one here from Sandra who asks, um, getting rejected constantly uh, and getting feedback is always uh, good, but you're not good enough. And being over 40 seems to be a huge issue. What can I do? Okay. Um, I'm so sorry about that because you know what, for those people who think that ASIM is, ASIM is not there, it is because when I was laid off, it was late 30, I felt it. Maybe it was perhaps the industry. I saw a lot of youngster people and even the leaders were really younger than me. So I felt that, do I fit in in this environment, right? I think you need to probably, the way that I would work, you know, word out is what kind of feedback you're getting. Um, you need to get the right feedback because we're all guilty of it. We become so diplomatic on delivering those feedback, uh, we tend to, you know, be blindsided with what we need to work on. So one thing that I've done it for myself is doing the SWOT on myself, strength, weakness, and opportunities and threat for the role that you're applying in and for the company I want to go in there too. There's the other tools when you Google it, um, 360 feedback is a great tool as well. So what we tend to do is we only want the feedback from the people that we love, but you want to probably go and find out, you know, the feedback from the people that you don't get along either because those are the golden nuggets, right? And start reflecting. Is it something that, you know, you were never aware of it and try to connect the dots as well. So figure it out um, by soliciting the feedback. And SurveyMonkey is something that I've used it as well. It's free um, and it works the wonder. And then go back and see what kind of feedback you're getting it and then start to work on it. Is it the courses? Is it the upgrade? Is it the tool? Is it the resources? So it depends on what kind of feedback you're getting it. But most of us do not deliver the right feedback because we're not trained as a hiring manager sometime. And sometimes they don't really wanna go out there because there's a lawsuit involved as well, right? Yeah, definitely. And also, like you said, you know, with ageism, it's definitely a real thing. And especially recently um, during the last recession that was caused by the pandemic, you ended up having people who were older being the first ones to get laid off. And they're also um, the people who take the longest to find work because ageism is a systemic issue. However, you know, make sure that that isn't sort of eating away at your self-confidence because that can also sort of self-sabotage you. And, you know, Sweta, we have um, a, a question here, and I think this is, uh, this relates to what we just talked about. This is from Patricia. How do you get feedback from a hiring manager instead of just being told the company is uh, pursuing another direction. Uh, obvious, this is difficult. <laughs> I've done that actually, believe it or not. So I had this amazing company. Um, I traveled to actually get an interview and I was targeting, the, that was one of the targeted companies. So director and the manager interviewed me during the, um, so what I always did when I went for interview was um, ask, asking that question, setting the expectations, what's the next step now? So I asked them, I said, um, what's the next step now, right? How are the feedbacks gonna be delivered, right? Um, and then the manager and director told me, you know what, we usually send out email. I'm like, okay, do you normally, um, is it okay for a candidate to reach out to you? And the director said to me was, 
um, Swara, you know what? If that happens, whatever happens, you can directly, you know, connect with me and we can go through it. I kind of felt it, okay, maybe uh, I was not the right fit because it was unionized um, um, area and I can't, I didn't come from the union environment. Uh, but the interview was great. I felt it. And then I got an email right? Rejected email. It was my amazing company. I had whole pie. I was trying to move and stuff like that. And I had, <laughs> I connected with him on LinkedIn. And I said, you know what, I'll take up an offer. Thank you so much for opportunity. Um, and I'm pretty sure you've decided to go with the right candidate, but I really would like to get a feedback from you. It would help me grow because I'm blindsided right now what happened, right? So we're still in touch. And um, it's all about setting the expectations. Is it okay if I reach out to you? And then putting out there, the answer is going to be always no if you don't go out there. What should you do if you're a fresh graduate graduate with no prior experience? Okay. Um, you know, um, as much as you'd hate to hear from me, it's, you know, there's, there's, there's a barrier for fresh graduate as well, right? I wish the colleges and university actually trained you uh, from get go instead of you pay like thousands of dollars, but when you get out, you have no idea how do you go back to the workforce. And that's just so wrong in my opinion, right? So they have a career uh, services. Why are you not taking advantage of it, right? Um, are they trained well enough? Have they worked in the hiring industry, recruitment in industry to give you the golden nuggets, right? Try to build a personal branding from the student perspective. Be a mentor to someone junior, right? And the last thing you want to do is you always want to choose that co-op and internship. Always, always, even though it's for a couple of weeks, month, doesn't matter. That gives you some kind of exposure. And you know what? If you don't have that opportunity, create your own project and reach out to the people. Let's say you're a data analyst. One of the clients did that. So data analyst. Um, and you know what? You got to go out there and see, hey, this is what I can do. Put all those things together. So how many people were um, diversity is a huge topic right now. If you're a data analyst and one of my clients did that and he said was, OK, these are the biggest big company and these are the diversified people like, you know, race and everything. He put it out there. It was huge. And he tagged the company as well. Right. Make like, you know, bring them in house and you create your own project and go from there. Right. Yeah, no, that is such a good point and such a great idea. I, I think many people are also intimidated to just reach out to people and try to network. Um, what's your advice for overcoming this fear? When you're actually going back as a job seeker as well, I did exactly the same thing. How can I help you? So one of the example was there was a university that was happening. I wanted to move into the different um, city. And then I said, hey, there's an event happening. And who is actually tweeting? Who is actually doing the social media work? And I was good at social media back in those days, right? And I and they're like, we have no one, actually. I said, can I actually come in and shadow your team, um, social media team? And then can I actually, I have a SLR camera. And can I actually bring in and I'm going to start tweeting and help you out? No expectations, but that was my targeted company, okay? director said okay he's a great person like I kept on going back to him he gave me so many leads he introduced me to so many people and you know what never once I asked I told him I want to work here you know what I mean so like you know later on what happened was this guy where I helped him out he went to the media company major media company he interviewed me later on right you got to think about long term. If you as soon as you think about the short term, you're being selfish. What's in for them? Right. Add the value. And I think networking should be never about like, I want the job right now. Um, it's all about how I can help you. That's it. And start from there. How do you bounce back from being ghosted after what you thought was a great interview? Right. The good questions. I've been ghosted, um, too. And there are two way about going this right. Sometime there, if there's no feedback, there's no answer, that's an answer for you. What are you going to do about it, right? What, I always did two follow-ups. That was my rule of thumb. I'm going to go and approach, you know what, is there a status update on it? Um, and I'm going to go second. Approach would be, you know what, I did this. Maybe the email were on a spam folder. I, I'd like to give them a chance because I've seen how HR and recruitment industry works, right? I've worked with the talent acquisitions. and they're extremely busy. They're human as well. I don't think no one wants to ghost you, but situation happens, something happens. Maybe the hiring manager dropped the ball on them, right? They're a part of team. So you got to give them benefit of doubt. And then after second time, you feel like, you know what? I think that's not the right company then, right? For you. So be willing to work out. And then I think the only thing you can control right now is how do you not get ghosted? I have blog, what to ask during interview and teaching you.com blog sections. I have YouTube channel as well. You can go there and see what are the 
questions you should be asking to avoid that ghosting. Right questions will get you right there. So for example, when are you going to wrap this, uh, wrap this interview up? One week, two weeks? As a hiring manager, I'm supposed to let you know if I'm trained properly. But a lot of hiring managers and recruiters are not trained how to do the interview. So if I'm doing interview, I would tell them next step. And if you don't hear back from me, then call me or there's a channel. Where do you follow up, right? But if they don't know how to handle it, take onus on yourself. It's a two-way street. Don't be sitting in there and being like, you know, taking the order. This is your job to find out that you want to work for them or not, right? So you want to make sure you ask the right questions. When do I hear back from you? By what channel? So what that does is if you do not hear back from them in two weeks, then you go as discussed. That's what, you know, that's what we agreed on, whatever. There's a template script I teach people. And then go back. Now you're not being pushy. You're holding them to the standard, but nicely. And then follow up again. Following up is not des like you know, being desperate at all. How you do it matters as well. Don't just go like, as for my previous email, we all hate that, right? <laughs> so like I said, like you said, right? Be very uh, authentic about it, but hold them accountable. But be very cautious on, you know, burning that bridge too, because sometimes, you know, hiring manager has so many things going on. You got to end up on their feet as well. And I think the rule of thumb is two follow-ups for me. That's what I did. Yeah, that sounds about right. And I, you make such a good point about not burning bridges because, uh, you know, there's so many different variables. Um, and sometimes an HR person or a recruiter, they're caught between maybe a hiring manager who's moving forward with someone, but they don't want to close the position yet. So that could take maybe another two, three weeks, and they don't want to really uh, tell you that you they've moved on until they're certain that something else has happened. So even though it's often very difficult, make sure that you're still nice to to them that you're not going to burn that bridge because you might need to cross it again at some point. Um, well, and Sweta, thank you so much for joining us. This was such a great conversation. Now I'll leave it with this. You know what? If you quit, that's okay. That's okay to quit. I've quit twice. That's okay. Here I am today. Okay. And then if you've been laid off, they, you know what? They did not take your brain. Okay. You got your skills back and go where you're celebrated if you want to switch. And thank you so much for having me, Andrew. Of course. And, you know, I hope everyone was following along at the bottom of the screen. Uh, you post so much wonderful content. Um, so, you know, make sure you're following Sweta on LinkedIn. And Keith even said that he's going to be sending an email asking about a hiring timeline to an employer. So uh, he definitely got a lot out of this conversation. I know everyone else did too. So thanks so much, Sweta. Mm -hmm.